In this eight-part series, I discuss problems common to philosophy and to religion. My focus is our struggle with nihilism, the fear that our lives and the world itself may be meaningless. This sixth part addresses the third of three major orientations in the spiritual history of humanity. Call it the struggle with the world. Its central idea is that a series of self-transformations and of transformations of society can increase our share in the attributes that we ascribe to the divine and give us a larger life. This belief may or may not be included within a larger narrative of transactions between God and mankind. The struggle with the world has spoken in two voices, one sacred, the other profane. Its sacred voice is the voice of the Semitic religions of salvation, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Its profane voice is the voice of the secular projects of liberation, the political programs of democracy, liberalism, and socialism, and the worldwide popular romantic culture which, allied with democracy, conveys the message that every ordinary man and woman is godlike. The struggle with the world is now the most authoritative set of ideas in the world. For over two centuries, it has helped set all of humanity on fire. But if it is incomparably strong, it is also now strangely weak. Its votaries no longer know what its next step should be. It is lost. The differences between the sacred and the profane versions of the struggle with the world matter. They matter to the content of the message, to the orientation of our lives, and to the allocation of authority. We should resist the attempt to split the difference between believing and not believing. A powerful tendency in contemporary culture would treat the sacred form of the struggle with the world as the mythological or allegorical expression of our secular and humanistic ideas. This halfway house of belief betrays confusion and self-deception and invariably stands in the service of an effort to sugarcoat our conventional pieties. The world, however, needs no help to reproduce itself. Despite the real differences between the sacred and the profane forms, of the struggle with the world. There is a significant ground of shared belief between them. I divide these remarks into two parts. In the first part, I explore this core of shared belief the conception of humanity, the vision of reality, 
and the existential orientation. In the second part, I ask three sets of questions about the struggle with the world and its future. How can it regain its force, its forward movement? What are its limitations? especially as revealed by the way in which it deals with the threat of nihilism. And what lies beyond it in the future spiritual experience of mankind? The conception of humanity. At the center of the struggle with the world, lies a view of our relation to the world in which we find ourselves. We are incarnate in dying organisms, and we are shaped by the social and cultural worlds that we build and inhabit. Nevertheless, there is always more in us, in each of us individually and in all of us collectively, the human race, than there is or ever can be in these social and cultural contexts. They are finite with regard to us. We are infinite with respect to them. In the old theological vocabulary, we are the infinite imprisoned within the finite. This dialectic between context and transcendence recurs in every domain of our experience. It manifests itself, for example, in the character of the mind. The mind has two aspects. In one aspect, it is like a machine. It is modular and formulaic. <clears throat> in another aspect, however, the mind is an anti-machine. It is not modular. It is not formulaic. It displays a power of recursive infinity to combine everything with everything else in indefinite numbers of ways, and it enjoys the power that the poet called negative capability. To reach beyond its own presuppositions and limits. This second aspect of the mind is what we call imagination. The relation between these two aspects of the mind, the machine-like aspect and the anti-machine-like aspect, is not predetermined by the physical constitution of the brain. Society and culture can be so organized that they either increase or diminish the space for the movement of the imagination. And in this sense, the history of politics is internal to the history of the mind. Although this view of our humanity, organized around the dialectic between context and transcendence, stands at the very center of our civilization. Almost all the characteristic intellectual achievements of our culture fail completely to express it. Take, for example, classical social theory. One of its central ideas 
was the idea that the structures of society and culture are artifacts. They are our creations. We made them, and because we made them, we can understand them and we can change them. This revolutionary insight has nevertheless almost always been circumscribed by a series of concessions to historical determinism that rob it of much of its force. And so it happens in almost every department of thought. The view of humanity that I have just outlined develops against the background of a vision of reality and of our place in it that is also an essential element of the struggle with the world. There is only one real world. The most important thing about the world is that it is what it is and not something else. Time is real and goes all the way down. Nothing is exempt from time. History is open. The new, the really new, is possible. Because the possible is not simply a ghost stalking the world and waiting for its cue to come onto the stage of actuality. The self has indefinite, if not infinite, depth. And there is more potential in the commonplace, in the ordinary, in the vulgar, than in the noble and the elevated. This conception of humanity and this vision of reality inform an orientation to the world. One of the focal points of this orientation has to do with the relation between self and structure. To be free, to develop our lives and our consciousness, we must engage in a particular social and cultural world. Engagement is one of the conditions of self-construction. But every engagement in a particular world threatens us with the loss of self, with subjugation, and depersonalization. We would be freer and greater to the extent that we could engage in a particular world without surrendering to it. Keeping the last word for ourselves. There are two opposing errors that we must therefore avoid in understanding the relation between self and structure and orienting our lives accordingly. According to one error, there is a definitive structure of thought and of social life that accommodates all the experience that we have reason to value. And this structure, this structure of all structures, this definitive ordering of thought and of life is gradually revealed in the course of history. There is no such structure. All we have or can ever have in the world are finite and flawed settings. So we can never hope to be fully at home in the world. 
every attempt to describe a definitive structure or to salute its imminent emergence in history represents a form of idolatry and thus a threat of enslavement. According to the opposing error, the error characteristic of Romanticism, for example, we cannot hope ever to change the basic relation between structure and spirit. If by spirit we designate our power to defy and to transcend structure, Structures are structures, according to this view. They are the hand of Midas, freezing and killing our humanity. They are indispensable or unavoidable. But we are fully human only in those interludes of rebellion in which we shake their power. Romantic love against the routines of marriage the crowd in the streets against the arrangements of the state. This error is a form of despair. It is also a form of illusion. The truth is that we can change the character as well as the content of our structures. Creating structures that invite their own revision and thus allow us more fully to split the difference between being insiders and outsiders. We can create arrangements in society and in thought that diminish the distance between the ordinary moves that we take within a framework of arrangements and assumptions that we leave unchallenged and unchanged, and the extraordinary moves by which from time to time, usually under the provocation of crisis, we challenge and change pieces of this framework. And to that extent, we become freer and greater. Our interest in the creation of such structures that allow us to participate in them without surrendering to them is intimately related to our most fundamental material and moral interests to our material interest in the development of our practical powers of production, and to our moral interest in the weakening and the eventual overcoming of entrenched schemes of social division and hierarchy, such as the structures of a class society. The liberals and socialists of the 19th century believed in a pre-established harmony or a natural convergence between these material and moral interests. And they proposed, according to their different orientations, a particular institutional program that they hoped would promote both the material and the moral interests. They were mistaken. But we would be mistaken if we replaced their dogmatism by the tragic dogma of an insoluble contradiction between our moral and material interests. Our task is to find the zone of potential intersection between the institutional requirements for the development of our practical powers and the institutional conditions for the overcoming of entrenched social division and hierarchy. 
the common element lies precisely in the creation of arrangements and of methods that rather than presenting themselves as part of the furniture of the universe, facilitate their own transformation. A second focal point in the existential orientation of the struggle with the world has to do with the relation between the self and others. In the dominant moral beliefs of almost all the great historical civilizations, altruism has been taken to be the organizing principle of the moral life. According to this view, the overriding problem is the containment of self-regard or selfishness. To convince us that each of us is not the center of the world. For these dominant beliefs in world history, the highest form of solidarity is a detached benevolence given from on high, intimately related to the serenity that we achieve by participating in the attributes of an impersonal God. The struggle with the world has produced a revolution in our moral beliefs. The consequence of this revolution is to assert that the detached benevolence offered from a distance is lower and not higher than personal love among equals, achieved at the price of heightened reciprocal vulnerability. There is a conception of the requirements of self-construction that stands at the basis of this view. According to this conception, to be free, we must connect. We must connect cognitively, emotionally, and practically. And yet, Every form of connection threatens us with the loss of our individuality. Freedom, a greater life, a higher being, results from our success in reconciling these conflicting requirements of self-assertion. And it is in the experience of personal love that we reconcile them most fully. Connecting with the other, not as a threat to our being, but as a deepening and reaffirmation of the experience of existence. What is the relation between these two great themes? the theme of transcendence over structure, and the theme of the primacy of love in the organization of moral experience. It is in love that we most fully recognize one another as the context transcending agents, as the originals, that we all know ourselves to be. In a world in which we face forever the threat of nihilism, of groundlessness in the perspective of mortality, love supplies a ground, an assurance of an unconditional place in the world.
Thus the connection between the idea of the self as spirit and the idea of the primacy of love. There is, however, a problem. The problem is that we are not yet fully these beings who are able to resist and to transcend context and to imagine and accept one another as context transcending agents. We must make ourselves into these beings. And to make ourselves into them, we must reshape society. From this insight arises the fundamental connection between the existential orientation and the political projects of the struggle with the world. The structure of the contemporary societies is in many decisive ways inimical to these aspirations. In the first place, it is hostile to them because it continues to deny to most of ordinary humanity the economic and educational equipment for self-construction. All the contemporary societies remain class societies. And in all of them, most men and women are condemned to economically dependent wage labor and required to work as if they were the machines that they are not. In the second place, the contemporary societies slight the vital connection between self-construction and solidarity. They fail to ensure a practical basis for social solidarity other than the practices of compensatory redistribution by tax and transfer organized through the state. The only sufficient basis for social solidarity would be our direct engagement with other people outside the boundaries of family selfishness. In the third place, the contemporary societies deny these aspirations because they continue to be organized, especially in their political life, in such a form that change remains dependent on crisis. No trauma, no transformation is the rule of their political regimes. And thus, we continue to have to choose between engagement and isolation. Engaging only at the cost of surrender. This exploration of the common ground between the sacred and the profane forms of the struggle with the world suggests the answer to the question, how can this orientation regain its force and become, in practice, as strong as it is in the spiritual allegiance of humanity. The only way in which it can regain its forward movement is by recognizing the full range of contradictions between its message 
and our established beliefs and arrangements. Its revolutionary potential is far from exhausted. To take advantage of this potential, however, we must repudiate the halfway house between belief and unbelief. The conversion of the doctrines of the struggle with the world into the sugarcoating of our conventional progressive ideas. What are the limitations of the struggle with the world? They are revealed most clearly in the way in which it deals with the threat of nihilism. Consider these limitations from two complementary perspectives. From one angle, the struggle with the world is an adventure because it requires us to enter into a pathway of cumulative change. And any adventure may fail. We can seek an insurance against this risk of failure through the guarantee that would be given by an intervening deity. In this way, we double our bets. But the doubling of the bet through the appeal to the intervention of a transcendent God in human history fails to solve the problem. Our ideas about the divine remain confused. The conception of God as a person remains an anthropomorphic projection. The conception of God as an impersonal being removes the divine from the range of our immediate experience and concerns. And thus we are driven to the third residual but intellectually empty position of God as non-being and non-person. And our doubts are not quieted. The popes themselves cry for their mothers on their deathbeds. The only adequate solution to this problem is to understand that living for the future, for the future of this transformative adventure, must be a way of living in the present as a being not determined by the established circumstances of his existence. It is our present life that represents the only good we can ever fully possess. Consider the same problem from another perspective. The struggle with the world draws attention to the divergence between historical and biographical time. The salvation, secular or sacred that it promises, takes place only in the historical time of the species. We do not, however, live in historical time. We live in biographical time. To convert this promise of salvation into something real and accessible to us, we must find in our own experience a counterpart to the transformation of social and cultural structures 
that can take place only in historical time. There is such a counterpart. It lies in our relation to our own characters, the rigidified form of the self. The Greeks said that character is destiny. But character is the mummy that begins to form around each of us. We must break this mummy up from within and live in such a way that we die only once. The common element in the response to these two weaknesses of the struggle with the world is the affirmation of life, of vitality, possessed right now in the present moment as the supreme good. What lies beyond the struggle with the world? To the extent that it cannot be reinterpreted or reconstructed, how should it be replaced? In the spiritual history of mankind, the struggle with the world forms one of the religious revolutions of the so-called axial age. It shares certain basic inclinations with the humanization of the world and with the overcoming of the world. The two other spiritual approaches that I have explored in the earlier parts of this series First, it organizes a dialectic between imminence and transcendence. The imminence of the divine in the world and its transcendence over the world. Second, it denies the ultimate reality and authority of all the divisions within mankind. Third, it attacks the heroic martial ethic of pride, valor, and vengeance in favor of an ethic of universal fellow feeling. And fourth, it provides, as it were, a two-sided ticket, which on one side is a license to escape the world, but on the other side is an invitation to change it. To these four shared characteristics of the religious revolutions of the Axial Age, we can add a fifth. The fifth is that they all seek to deny the ineradicable flaws in human existence, to deny them or to compensate for them. Our mortality, our groundlessness, our insatiability, and our susceptibility to belittlement. In both its sacred and its secular forms, the struggle with the world has aroused in all of humanity the aspiration of rising up to a greater life, of becoming more godlike. This is its revolutionary effect on the world. 
the fourth of the flaws in human existence, our susceptibility to belittlement, differs from the other three. Our mortality, our groundlessness, and our insatiability. It differs from them because it is something that we can change. And in this sense, it is not ineradicable. There lies the basis for a transformation in the future spiritual life of humanity. What lies beyond the struggle with the world, either as its reconstruction or as its replacement, is a form of social and spiritual life that takes as its program to raise our existence to a higher level of experience, of capability, of intensity, of vitality. We can describe this outcome in one vocabulary as the increase of our share in the attributes of divinity. And in another vocabulary, as the creation of the conditions that enable us to die only once, possessing life fully while we have it, if we cannot possess it eternally. The question we must ask ourselves is whether we can achieve this ascent without succumbing to a mendacious and heartless denial of our flawed humanity. We cannot achieve a larger life by turning ourselves into our own idols.